Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the USC US China Institute. I'm Clayton Duby. I'm with the USC US China Institute, and we are so fortunate to have Professor Julia Lavelle with us today to talk about her wonderful book, Maoism, A Global History. But we want to say thank you to you for coming as well, and we want you to feel uh, welcome to participate. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and throughout today's discussion, feel free to post your questions. Please try to make your questions concise and clear so that uh, we can make good use of them. Today, we're talking, of course, about Maoism. Maoism both within China and Maoism abroad. We'll talk about Maoism during Mao's life and the afterlives of Maoism, both within China and outside of China. Mao, of course, died in 1976, some 45 years ago. And at a few years later, the party formally criticized some of the things he did, including the launching the Cultural Revolution and other measures, completely repudiated his economic policies. But where can you find Mao in China today? Everywhere. His face is on virtually all of the currency. And of course, that giant six by five meter uh, portrait of Mao continues to loom large on Tiananmen, the gate of heavenly peace. And so we'll be talking about Mao in China and Mao outside of China. We'll talk about Mao during his day and Mao during ours. So there's a lot, a lot of ground to cover. And we are so fortunate because today our guide in this is Professor uh, Julia Lavelle. And she has produced this wonderful book, Maoism, A Global History, which first came out in fall 2019 and then uh, has been re-released in paperback. It's also available as an ebook. That's the form that I read it in, as well as an audio book. Well worth your time and energy. It's a terrific, a terrific volume. Professor Lavelle uh, graduated from uh, the University of Cambridge. She also, of course, studied at Hopkins Nanjing and carried out a lot of work there. One of the things that we'd like to note is that she is an incredibly productive scholar, uh, just phenomenally productive. She's the author of several books. So The Politics of Cultural Capital, How China Sought to Acquire, How it Sought to Win a Nobel Prize in Literature. Then she turned her energy to the Great Wall. What was it over 3,000 years? And did it work? When did it work? How did it not work? How has it been used? How has it been abused? She also wrote on the Opium War, looking at how the Opium War helped to produce the China of today, how China views itself and how it presents itself. She also has written on architecture and a whole host of other topics, uh, a prolific, not just author, but also translator. She's translated the story of Akyu and other stories from Lu Xun. She's uh, translated Serve the People by Yen Lian Ke, Lust Caution by Zhang Ailing, and she is so busy, so productive. She's just come out with Monkey King, Journey to the West, uh, a, a, a translation of one of China's most popular novels. And she tells us in the book Maoism, Mao's favorite. And maybe we'll get her to draw some comparisons there. So we are so fortunate to have Professor Lavelle with us. And remember, you're welcome to contribute questions uh, to the discussion by clicking on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. This is a rich book, and there are so many directions that we might go in, but I'd like to start uh, you know, with the, this paradox. Uh, Mao as a person, Mao as a political leader, the twists and turns in his thinking, in his actions, as well as 
how Mao exists in China today. And we get a sense of some of this in the very first chapter of your book, where we have this uh, giant Mao statue being erected in 2016 in Henan province. Professor Lavelle, could you tell us what we can take from the story of that, uh, that statue's creation and what happens to it? Yeah, so uh, that's a, um, a, a, a story that I put quite early um, in the book, and it was the story of this uh, extraordinary, oh, by the way, thank you so much for that incredibly generous introduction. I, I feel very overwhelmed and, and very honoured to be asked to speak on this occasion. But the, yeah, this, this, this story, which I uh, used very early on the book, is um, a, a tale of an enormous um, gold statue um, built um, in the middle of the countryside in, in Henan, which is near the centre of China. Um, and uh, it, uh, it so it, it, it suddenly loomed out of the Hernan countryside. Um, uh, but just a few days after it was revealed, um, it was decided um, that, uh, that this statue did not have planning permission or it somehow contravened planning regulations, although it really beggars belief how the local government failed to notice this thing going up before then. Um, and uh, and the thing was torn down. Um, and I decided to write about it because it seemed quite emblematic of the sort of illusory, um, ambivalent quality of Mao and Maoism in China and in the world today. So on the one hand, Mao is a looming figure. So as you say, he's all over the currency. There's his huge portrait hanging on the northern edge of Tiananmen Square, the heartland of Chinese political power. His sort of embalmed body lies in state in the center uh, of Tiananmen Square. There's tons of Mao memorabilia still uh, all over China. Um, and yet, uh, he is a, a historical figure in China whose complexities and enormities um, are effaced um, because potentially um, the errors that he uh, committed and his enormously divisive um, policies, um, uh, these, these, these sort of very um, negative aspects to his legacy um, uh, could undermine the legitimacy of the ruling Chinese Communist Party, who still claim to be flying the flag of Mao Zedong thought. But sort of beyond China, I thought this this strange statue, it's, 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 it's there, it's huge, and suddenly it's gone, is also emblematic of uh, how Mao has been seen across the 20th and early 21st centuries in global history. So at the time of the Cold War, he is a looming figure and a figure often of a sort of looming menace to the Western camp. You know, some of the commentary on Mao and Maoism uh, liken the man and his ideology uh, to the threat of Hitler and Nazism as, as being you know, truly um, expansive and ambitious um, and menacing to the Western world. And yet, since his death, um, the sort of clear importance and centrality of Mao and his ideas to many of the conflicts of the uh, Cold War, uh, I think, have been effaced. And I think that um, uh, uh, non-specialist historians, uh, particularly when trying to write global histories of communism or of the 20th century, uh, I think they've underestimated the spread, impact and resilience of Mao and his ideas um, in world history, in sort of contemporary world history. Um, so that was a couple of the re reasons why that particular 
anecdote um, seemed interestingly metonymic. And there were also a, a couple of other really interesting contradictions about it, which is tell us about the very paradoxical ways in which Mao's legacy has morphed and been distorted within China today. So as is uh, you know, well known, um, uh, Mao was the public enemy uh, of uh, religion and capitalism. But you know, if you look carefully at this statue, it didn't really look that much like Mao. You know, the pose in which he was depicted looked, looked more like um, uh, a, a kind of ancestor portrait, um, these, these portraits being at the, 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 the center of sort of popular local uh, religious cults across centuries and millennia. Uh, and another great irony is that the funding for the statue uh, came from local entrepreneurs. Um, and of course, as is very well known, um, uh, Mao you know, devoted you know, much of his life, particularly after he came to power after 1949, to destroying private enterprise, enterprise in China. So I felt it was just a very interesting, contradictory emblem of what Mao, uh, uh, what Mao was, and what he represents in China today. Yeah, that it, it's a fascinating story that you open with, that you take us deep into, and we have this religious shrine erected because that's sort of how it was intended to function for people to come and worship to honor. Mao. And of course, there's a business proposition that maybe this would spur tourism and things like that. And so you had people who uh, the reform era made made it possible for them to become wealthy. Uh, so the repudiation of Mao's policies cast aside, and then they look to cash in with this giant statue. You know, and as you say, placing the government in an odd position of not allowing the creation of this new place of veneration. Uh, it's it's a complicated legacy that Mao has and that you detail in the book. Absolutely. And and and, and Mao worship in China today is is something which does oddly enough make the governing Communist Party uncomfortable. Um, you know, many people have remarked on the way that um, Xi Jinping, um, the current party secretary who came to power in late 2012, the way that he has rehabilitated, really for the first time since Mao's death in 1976, he's rehabilitated on a national official level aspects of the Maoist political repertoire. And I really want to emphasize very heavily here, it's only aspects that he's rehabilitated. I'm not saying that she is a new Mao, but uh, I would, what, what, what seems uh, plausible and logical that Xi Jinping inheriting a Chinese Communist Party in a state of sort of existentially threatening corruption. He decided that he really needed to sort of dig deep into um, a kind of credible party heritage um, in order to sort of rebuild the um, sort of the moral credibility, if you like, of the Chinese Communist Party. And his, you know, he's, he's a man of the party. That's what he's been brought up in. And so it's not surprising that the repertoire that he reached back to was some form of Maoism. Um, and what he reached back for was the kind of um, ideological, uh, the, 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 the Maoism of ideological discipline um, and control, centralised party control, so sort of building a sort of strong militarised, uh, centralised um, party, sort of cracking down on corruption. So he sort of really made use of, of coverage and the image of the early Chinese Communist Party in, in Yan'an, a very poor part of northwest China in the 1930s and 1940s. But of course, there are major aspects of the Maoist heritage, uh, which uh, Xi Jinping is deeply uncomfortable with, you know, above all, the Mao of the Cultural Revolution. And that's almost a kind of anarchist 
Mao, um, you know, the Cultural Revolution is a, a, a unique event, really, in the, uh, the the global history of communism. It's the only event I know of, of a leader of a communist party in power, mobilising the grassroots to attack the establishment and the structures of that ruling communist party. Um, and in the course of these sort of very violent struggles that quickly ensued during the uh, Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping, who, you know, his, 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 his father was one of Mao's own revolutionary comrades and came from the revolutionary aristocracy. In the course of the Cultural Revolution, his own uh, father was uh, purged and imprisoned. Um, and Xi Jinping himself was uh, um, exiled, if you like, uh, to re-education through labour um, in a very poor part of China. Um, so, you know, the Cultural Revolution in Xi's eyes almost destroyed the party state and indeed his family. So Xi Jinping is not at all interested in the uh, grassroots mobilizations, the kind of ideological militancy of what you might call high Maoism of the late 1950s through to the 1970s. Instead, he wants to invoke Mao um, as a kind of august part of familias, a kind of founding father of the nation in order to kind of shore up his own historical legitimacy and the historical legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. But, you know, as, as many sort of wonderful scholars have written, you know, there are noisy, um, radical neo-Maoists in China today um, who actually often invoke some of Mao's most radical sayings and ideas from the Great Leap Forward, from the Cultural Revolution, sort of ideas of sort of radical levelling and egalitarianism and sort of standout policies such as, you know, big, big communes, kind of collective economy. They use these ideas directly to criticize the kind of marketization and the globalization um, that uh, Chinese Communist Party rule since Mao's death has brought in. Um, so these groups who are really happy to run with the radical Mao um, have long been a source of sort of great suspicion for the party state and sort of exist in a sort of very uneasy relationship, you know, sometimes they're tolerated, but, you know, sometimes they're chased off their internet platforms, um, you know, they can't publish easily and so on. No, that is, uh, for me, one of the truly fascinating things. Xi Jinping has insisted that the entire history of communist rule over the uh, People's Republic of China needs to be honored, celebrated, respect it. And so he, you know, certainly will acknowledge mistakes were made, as it were, but that Mao founded this party that, in his mind, has given China so much. So uh, that's why he's worthy of respect. But he has these problematic uh, followers who want to remember class struggle, who want to emphasize the great inequality that exists in present day China and want to talk about the exploitation of workers by owners and that sort of thing, or people who might want to uh, side with poor peasants against officials who want to use their land for development. And so you've, you've wonderfully highlighted in the book that tension. Uh, Xi Jinping's Communist Party is all about control, all about order. And Mao offers this countervailing example of somebody who embraced a certain amount of disorder to bring about the things he wanted. Yeah, exactly. I, but I think another really important part of contemporary neo-Maoism, which sometimes works in the favor of the party state, but also often threatens to veer or escalate out of control is nationalism. So many neo-Maoists who I've spoken to and interviewed or read tend also to be sort of very passionate 
patriots or nationalists. Um, and you know, one way that they get this out of Mao is that you know they really celebrate the idea of, of, of Mao's brinksmanship within the Cold War, you know, so the 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 the, the way that he um was um himself and made China a uh, sort of public enemy number one of the United States. So he's sort of seen as someone who wasn't afraid of of, of confronting the other big superpowers in the world, you know, especially the United States. Um, and so this is a double-edged sword for the party state. And I think it's something that they are worrying about at the moment. It's certainly uh, something that a former high-ranking party official was writing about recently. You know, this, 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 this card of nationalism, which has been increasingly played by the Chinese Communist Party since the 1990s with, you know, the, 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 the disaster of 1989, um, when sort of clinging to the idea of, of, of Marxism seemed um, not really credible as a way of building political legitimacy. So from the 1990s, the Chinese Communist Party really tried to reinvent itself as um, defender of the national interest rather than as a kind of politically correct, politically puritanical Marxist entity. Um, so really up things like um, patriotic education in schools and sort of patriotic culture with museums and films and so on. Um, often very much emphasizing China's traumatic history of sort of invasion and occupation from the 19th century onwards. Um, and you've, you can see um, the results of this in a way this campaign has been very successful, you know, particularly from the late 1990s onwards, you saw a real uptick in sort of um, open protests on the streets um, uh, against what was seen as sort of affronts to uh, China's national sovereignty perhaps the bombing of the Chinese embassy uh, in Belgrade, but sort of very often anti-Japanese demonstrations and protests. But at all these protests, the, you know, the, although on, on the one hand they are tolerated, um, but there's always a worry on the part of the party state and the security state that the sort of emotion sort of bubbling out onto the street can get out of hand. You know, the lesson of 1989 is when you get emotions out on the street, things become very unstable, very unpredictable. And that's obviously not going to be uh, a comfortable thought for a party state that really pins its legitimacy on sort of building a kind of authoritarian capitalism um, and on selling itself as you know achieving uh, what it calls China's national rejuvenation so sort of rebuilding the the the, the, the prosperity uh, that enabled China to you know, be one of the most powerful empires in the world in the 18th century and sort of really take up its take up its place in the sun. So this nationalism, which is um, uh, you know, a really strong edge of contemporary neo-Maoism is something else that makes the party state uncomfortable. It's something that you know, always threatens to bubble out of control and, and the, 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 these nationalists, um, you know, if something goes wrong, politically or economically or domestically, um, there's always the risk that these, these neo-Maoist um, uh, nationalists can say to the contemporary CCP, well, actually, you're the hand gen, you know, you're, the, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're the national traitors here. Yeah, that, of course, is that great fear. And it wouldn't be the first time that a nationalist protest became an anti-government protest. Uh, that sort of thing. And we saw in 2012, and you mentioned anti-Japanese protests, and in 2012, uh, demonstrations outside the Japanese embassy over having to do with the Diaoyu Senkaku Island dispute, and protesters there showed up with portraits of Chairman Mao and held those up, as well as occasional appearances in these labor protests. Uh, former uh, US diplomat Brian Goldbeck raises in the Q&A uh, space uh, something that I experienced as well in the early 1990s, where you'd have taxi drivers who would have the small portrait of Chairman Mao dangling from, you know, from their rear view mirror. And there are all sorts of stories, and you talk about uh, you know, how, how uh, he's seen as a protector as well as this nationalist symbol. Uh, 
that sort of thing. And so you have, again, this, you know, this cult of Mao that, uh, you know, the government nourishes, but also is quite, quite concerned about. Now, one of the things uh, that you just hit upon that's so fascinating, and you go into this in the book, uh, Ma the Mao of the Cold War. Um, and you talk, for example, uh, and there's so many different ways that we could go with this, but uh, specifically about the antagonism towards the Soviet Union, uh, and which we see emerge in the 1950s. And you highlight in the book, uh, you know, the ways in which Mao deliberately sought to humiliate or put Khrushchev on his back foot and those sorts of things and how China winds up defending Stalin, even though Mao loathed Stalin and loathed what Stalin had had forced upon China, be it the Korean War or any number of other things. And so that's a really fascinating thing that during these days, Mao is taking on the Soviet Union and he's taking on China, uh, taking on the United States and supporting whatever protests, whatever difficulties uh, the United States may be having, be it in Vietnam or elsewhere. And I was wondering if you could talk about that aspect of Mao's willingness to take on these and how that was a very important part of Maoism that traveled well, that you might be relatively poor, you may not have the strongest forces today, but you could take on anyone if only you mobilize. Yeah, um, that's such a, a, a bunch of interesting points. Um, the the Sino-Soviet split, so this this huge row which blows up between China and the Soviet Union um, in the 1950s is quite challenging to understand sometimes from a contemporary vantage point because so many of the ideological quarrels between the USSR and China seems so dry and so abstract, but you know, at the heart of it is a row about the path to world revolution. So as is well known, Khrushchev um, denounced Stalin in his secret speech, um, his tyranny, his personality cult, um, but also the crash collectivization that had caused the deaths by starvation of so many Soviet citizens in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And something else that Mao really hated about de-Stalinization was Khrushchev arguing for peaceful coexistence with the US. Uh, so Khrushchev argued that communism would win the global battle um, through demonstrating its superiority at building prosperity. Now, now Mao hated all those ideas. Um, he was, of course, keen on the personality cult and on the use of terror to achieve political aims. Um, and also through the 1950s, he was plotting and he carried out his own crash collectivization through which he thought China would uh, leap straight into a communist miracle. Um, and he always remained a militant revolutionary. So he was convinced that the world revolution would only succeed through violent insurrection. And so it was Mao's love of radical, violent solutions to uh, the world revolution that appealed to so many impatient radicals from the 1960s onwards, uh, from the Americas to Europe to Africa and uh, Asia. And there are a few more elements within Maoism which are um, helpful to him uh, winning this appeal. Um, one of the really important ideas in Maoism is this thing called voluntarism. So Mao believed that the Chinese people, in fact, any other people in the world, could achieve anything they wanted as long as they believed they could. So it was kind of revolutionary ideological fervor that was important rather than uh, superiority of wealth or weaponry. It's very easy to see how that could appeal to sort of under armed, under 
supplied underdogs in all parts of the world. There was also a strong anti-colonial message to Maoism, which is partly there in the text, but it's partly kind of imputed to Mao because of a historical contingency, because the Chinese uh, communist revolution um, is successful at the same time as decolonization mm. is taking off as a global political phenomenon. Um, so, uh, you know, often in the developing world, Mao's revolution was seen as a, a as an inspirational blueprint. It was it was seen as a poor agrarian nation sort of seeing off threats uh, from imperialism in Europe, uh, the US um, and in Japan. So it was seen as a, a, a possible model for decolonizing radicals in the developing world in the, in the developing world as well. Uh, it, it, this is a very rich book for all those who are watching and haven't yet read this book, uh, it, you know, more than 500 pages, and it is incredibly, incredibly useful in how it travels across time and across space. Now, one of the things that's really fascinating about this is the Mao myth. Uh, you know, one of the key players in building that is an American journalist, Edgar Snow. And you talk about how Snow, uh, you know, for, you know, it, it could see a great story and went to get that great story and how that story was carefully curated for him. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the role that uh, Edgar Snow and Red Star over China uh, which comes out, you know, in about 37, 38, and is a huge success. And how that plays a role in making Mao uh, somebody who, you know, in fact, new Chinese newspapers talked about Mao Zhu uh, and things like that, you know, you know Mao Zedong and, and Judah and that sort of thing, and labeled them bandits and those kinds of things. How this book humanizes Mao and shares his story and what is purported to be the story of the Chinese Communist Party with this wider world. It's an amazing, it's, it's an amazing story. It is a very curious story. And um, as I researched and wrote the book, I actually came to see the beginning of global Maoism as lying, strangely enough, uh, within this best-selling travel book called Red Star Over China, uh, which was written by this uh, American journalist from Kansas um, called Edgar Snow. And what this book does is it is it created Mao as a global political personality in 1937, five years before Mao actually became paramount leader of the Chinese Communist Party of the CCP and, and six years before that party coined the phrase uh, Mao Zedong thought. Um, so just a tiny bit of background here. I mean, Snow was one of the first Westerners, one of the first Americans to visit the breakaway Chinese communist state in Northwest China in 1936, which at that point was the underdog uh, in uh, a sort of very bitter civil war with um, the, uh, the, the party regime nominally ruling China at the time, the, the nationalist, the Kuomintang. So Snow um, was invited by uh, the Chinese communist leadership to visit this, uh, the, the communist state in the Northwest in 1936. He spent several weeks there. Um, he was given a red carpet treatment and extensive access to Mao. So, you know, because the, the, all the details about the planning for the visit uh, are still locked up in the central party archives, we can't know exactly and 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 those archives are, are certainly out of bounds for any foreigner and i think for just about uh, most chinese researchers too so we we can't know exactly what the chinese communist party did to prepare for the visit um but the evidence suggests that it was a, a pretty carefully 
mm. choreographed visit with, as I say, you know, excellent sort of red carpet treatment um, for Snow. Um, so Edgar Snow was charmed by Mao and by um, other uh, parts of the leadership and and, and the, the Chinese communist state that he saw. And he wrote up a very favourable account of Mao and of Chinese communism in his book, Red Star Over China. The book quickly became a global bestseller and it really had legs internationally. Um, so it was um, a, a bestseller in the Anglophone world, but it was also read by um, uh, um, sort of anti-Japanese and anti-colonial guerrillas across Southeast Asia. It was read by Russian partisans during World War II, um, by anti-colonial um, uh, fighters in India. It's also it was also hugely influential within China itself. So the Chinese translation came out almost simultaneously with the uh, English original um, in the autumn of 1937, um, while Shanghai uh, is locked in this sort of horrendous um, uh, conflict with uh, Japanese invaders. And the Chinese translation of the book made a big impact on educated, idealistic young urbanites in cities like Shanghai. Um, so it's, it, it portrayed, the book portrayed um, Mao and the Chinese communists as idealistic patriots and it 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 convinced many of its readers um in chinese that that, that that the communists were the real patriots the real warriors in the struggle against japan rather than the nationalists um and as a consequence um many of these sort of educated uh talented energetic people make this very dangerous journey um across china out to the northwest to join the communist movement and this migration is a huge huge boost to the Chinese Communist Party in building a state in a very poor, very isolated part of China. But I'd also say the book has an influence across time as well as space. So after the witch hunts of McCarthyism uh, in the 1950s um, somewhat receded uh, into the 1960s, young people in the US and also in, in Western Europe, um, of course, became intensely critical of US foreign policy towards China. Um, many were sympathetic to Mao era China as an extension of sympathy towards uh, North Vietnam. And this generation of young people rediscovered Snow's book from the 1930s and also his later sympathetic mm -hmm. books um, about China after 1949, um, uh, including one that denied the existence of a famine in the early 1960s. And this sort of new generation of readers acclaimed Red Star Over China as a reliable documentary affirmation of the fundamental revolution or uh, sort of the, the, the fundamental righteousness of the Chinese Communist Party both before and after it took power. So it, it was it was it was a book truly with 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 enormous um domestic and global impact. Uh, it one of the striking things for me in the 1980s was to find this uh Chinese language biography of Mao. That was the title, Mao Zedong Zhuan. But in fact, it was written by Edgar Snow, and it was an extract of Red Star Over China uh, that you know gets published. And as you say, it has this sweeping reach. And one of the things that you know comes through in your your incredible research uh, for this book, uh, seeing that Snow volume, but also other things that later in the 50s and 60s reach Southeast Asia, reach Africa, and reach beyond. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, you know, the, real, uh, the real experience of some of the Malaysian communists in China and the place of Mao thought in uh, the so-called emergency, the troubles uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s in Malaysia. And again, talk about uh, Mao as an inspiration to these folks who are fighting against colonialism, fighting uh, what, they, what they see as this horrific oppression. Mm. 
so sort of moving on then from the um uh, the, the 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 launching, if you like, of global Maoism um, in Red Star over China. Mao's ideas and practices um, spread, you know, across the ensuing decades, practically to every continent. You know, not always, but actually quite often assisted by the appeal of Snow's original text. Um, and one of the sort of early episodes in the spread of these ideas is throughout the colonial and decolonizing world, especially in the, the first hot conflicts of the Cold War. Um, so I'm thinking about conflicts um, in Malaya, the so-called Malayan emergency beginning in the late 1940s, um, and uh, uh, the struggle um, in, in, in Vietnam uh, against um, uh, French colonialism, um, uh, a, a struggle which is, is later taken over, the, 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 the French role is, is taken over by the United States. Um, so you know, the, the, the ideas and practices of Mao strongly influenced the Malayan Communist Party as it uh, fought the emergency um, against the British state uh, in Malaya. Um, there's also a lot of practical as well as ideological um, assistance uh, to um, Vietnamese communist fighters under the direction done under the direction of uh, Ho Chi Minh um, and this question though is it's it's an uncomfortable one um, for historians to consider because um, analyses of this issue have become very um, tied up with you know very sort of toxic sort of difficult debate within history um, the the debate about the the, the so-called domino theory um, so you know from uh, although the, the the domino theory is 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 seen as starting with a speech by Eisenhower in the 1950s but the ideas of the domino theory um, above all that if um, uh, key states in Southeast Asia um, uh, sort of tumble if you like um, to uh, uh, sort of communist subversion uh, the whole region will and that will have sort of huge implications for the strategic balance of power uh, within, within, within Asia. So this is an idea which you see in, in a lot of government documents from the 1940s onwards, and it applies to Malaya, um, uh, it applies to Korea, and it applies to Vietnam. Um, and it has a sort of very toxic, uh, poisonous um, impact on uh, sort of foreign policy debates and decisions within the United States and leads to this sort of horrendous um, uh, entanglement and, and, and embroilment uh, with Vietnam. And so, you know, for, for good reasons, historians have um, uh, wanted to sort of undermine the idea of the domino theory because it's seen as propping up these sort of awful assumptions which led to such a terrible historical and human consequences um, in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, and so, and, and also it's, it, the, the, there's something that seems profoundly pro problematic about the idea of the domino theory because it, it makes of um, age actors and sort of agencies within South East Asia sort of completely passive, you know, sort of easily seduced, if you like, or sort of mesmerized by um, uh, um, direction from Moscow or direction from Beijing. So it's, it's, it's easy to see how these arguments are very problematic. Um, however, you should also though, if you start to look at some of the more reliable sources within government documents, for example, uh, intercepts, of Malayan Communist Party couriers uh, between Malaya and mainland China from the 1940s or 50s, or if you look at um, uh, a lar the large quantity of memoirs right. written by um, uh, active members of the Malayan Communist Party from the 1940s sort of through to the end of the uh, second emergency in the 1980s. Um, the relationship between China and, say, the Malayan Communist Party is, in fact, close 
and nurturing. And the sort of wonderful research done by mainland historians such as um, Shen Zhihua um, uh, does indicate that Mao was indeed ambitious to take a leading role in the world revolution almost before he takes power in China. Um, so, you know, Mao um, is very keen to set up a Marxism-Leninism Institute in Beijing, which becomes um, a, a, a kind of uh, a, 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 the, the place where uh, especially Asian revolutionaries uh, come to be sort of taught the theories of, of Mao's political and economic military strategy. And the theory really does seem to be that, you know, they will go back to their home states and they will spread these ideas of, of guerrilla warfare, which have been um, apparently so successful in China through the second half of the 1940s. And there's a you know, really wonderful um, set of conversations uh, which we now have available in translation between Mao and Zhou Enlai and other Chinese communist leaders and leaders of Southeast Asian uh, uh, communist parties. Uh, and actually, there are parts of that conversation which do show that, you know, Mao did have, he did believe in the domino theory um, in, his, in, in, in his own mind. He was very keen to take leadership um, of uh, the communist revolution in Vietnam, in Cambodia. Um, uh, in fact, to the point that um, relations ended up completely breaking down between the Vietnamese communists and the Chinese mm -hmm. communists, because, I mean, obviously Vietnam and China has a sort of long centuries, even millennia old sort of history of, of, of tensions as, as, as two um, big states sharing, share, sharing a border. Um, but but although you know Mao, Mao's China poured so much money and resources into uh, the Vietnamese communist cause, its sort of overbearing interference in Vietnamese um, communism uh, also sort of stirred sort of massive resentment and of course soured into the horrendous border war which is fought between these two states in the end of the 19 at the end of the 1970s uh, which of course is so destabilizing to people who've been observing this region you know how can these two allies uh, be fighting each other and i think that probably told many observers uh, that, um, uh, that 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 nationalism was alive and kicking in the global communist movement yeah and that if the if that had not been understood with the sino-soviet split uh, that definitely gets brought home at the end of the 1970s. Your book uh, in no way suggests that, you know, these insurgents in various places don't have agency of their own and that they adopted this stuff, uh, you know, complete and marched to Mao's tune. That's not this book at all. But it does show both uh, the receptivity of some of Mao's ideas and the deliberate effort on the part of the Chinese party state to extend uh, its reach. And that's really remarkable. As you, as you highlight in the book, uh, you know, $20 billion from a poor country over a quarter century to, to support uh, the anti-colonial national unification movement in Vietnam. Uh, you detail even more uh, the you know, the lack of appreciation on the part of the uh, North Korean party state. Uh, you know, Kim Il-sung, uh, you know, is determined not to be seen as a client, but is quite happy to take whatever can be taken uh, from, you know, both ideologically uh, in terms of practice and actual material and, you know, human support. Uh, and so that really comes through in this. And you also suggest ways in which, you know, Maoism and thought reform, all that stuff didn't necessarily work, didn't always find a receptive audience. You give the example of American prisoners of war, but also others uh, who, when they experience China firsthand and they see Maoism in action, are turned away from it. So that's that's part of the complexity that comes through in your book. One of I, the things that's really powerful 
is the example, for example, in, you know, a very different place, Peru, and the impact on a Peruvian insurgents, uh, in, you know, would be revolutionary and insurgency. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about beyond, you know, beyond Asia, into Latin America, into Africa, some of Maoism on the road, as it were. Sure. So, so to answer that question, but also to just to pick up on the tail end of our previous conversation, um, I would say that a big part of the story of global Maoism is unintended consequences. So, you know, despite often, you know, relative to the, you know, the, the, the GDP of China at the time, huge amounts of money but also time and energy and ingenuity are often expended um, in uh, uh, sort of sending parts of the of the the, the Mao China toolkit um, far abroad, um, for example, to Africa. Um, so sort of huge outlay of money, um, sort of. Uh, um, scholarships for African students in China, um, uh, building of railways, um, other infrastructure projects like sort of mills and factories. Um, but what really strikes me about the African case is how little political traction that wins Mao era China. You know, we could perhaps make an argument that, you know, China's um, uh, uh, position in Africa today um, doesn't come from nowhere, that it sort of rests on many more decades of uh, outreach to Africa. Um, that's a separate historical conversation. But if we're actually looking at, you know, the time that Mao was alive, you know, we're looking at the impact of Mao's outreach to Africa between the 1950s and 1970s, when often, you know, China gives aid that it cannot afford to give, you know, it's giving aid to African states at the height of the, the, the post Great Leap Forward famine. So when people in China are, are, are dying from for lack of grain. So it sort of gives this huge amount of aid. But what's striking is that um, no decolonized African state or leader um, uh, makes use of the uh, Maoist Chinese mm -hmm. framework for state building. I think that post-colonial African leaders are um, notable rather for their kind of um, uh, sort of omnivorous political appetite. You know, they take all sorts of uh, um, parts of, of, of different political models. Um, so, you know, no copycat Maoist state is actually built in Africa, I think the closest we get is, um, you know, Maoist political strategy um, is imported quite directly uh, into the ZANU insurgency in southern Rhodesia. Um, but in terms of the state that Robert Mugabe builds after 1980, you yeah, know, that is absolutely not the Maoist model. But then, then sort of turning to your really interesting question about Peru, again, I, I think that, um, that instantiates how unpredictable mm -hmm. the trajectory of Mao's travels are. So the case study I focused on um, for Maoism in Latin America, there are many others I could have chosen, but the one I focused on because it's 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 well known and I think people would 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 ask why I hadn't mentioned it um uh if I didn't go into it in detail is the Sendero Luminoso the 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 shine the 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 the, the communist party uh shining path uh in Peru um and uh so uh under a um Peruvian radical a former philosophy prof called Abimal Guzman uh the shining path Fights, um, a really bitter Maoist civil war uh, against a sort of failing, failed Peruvian, but democratic Peruvian uh, state. 
through the 1980s uh, up until the sudden capture of Guzman in 1992 after the decapitation of the movement the the the, the war quite quickly falls apart but you know up to that point the it, it, it's really looking quite possible and plausible that the state could be toppled by this very fundamentalist puritanical Maoist regime. And if you looked at this, this incredibly strange thing, you know, this is happening after the death of Mao, when um, China's own rulers, uh, although they sort of haven't wholesale sort of repudiated Mao in the way that Khrushchev uh, did for Stalin in the 1950s, they've certainly dismantled the sort of keynote policies of high Maoism. So, you know, mass spectacle, purges, um, collectivization, big communes, and that have gone back to private enterprise and, and, and farming. So this seems like a very sort of weird, unpropitious moment for a Maoist insurgency to take place anywhere, but you know, especially in Peru, you know, this is a place that's, 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 that's democratic, um, that uh, uh, you know, just doesn't look like China in the 1930s and 1940s, and yet Guzman um, enacts this sort of very slavish, um, sort of textually faithful uh, reenactment of uh, the principles of Maoism. And I think sort of understand this, you know, we, we, we started talking about the Sino-Soviet split and the Cold War in the 1960s. Uh, and you know, we can't understand what's happening in Peru in the 1980s unless we really take a deep dive into the politics of the Sino-Soviet split, however arid and abstract it seems. It means a lot to many people, many radicals through the 1960s. Um, so Guzman, uh, so, so, so as part of the Sino-Soviet split, the Chinese Communist Party kind of very aggressively bombards the world, including the developing world, with so-called external propaganda, so sort of magazines and tracts and um, foreign language broadcasting, uh, extolling the virtues of Mao's China. And Abimal Guzman, um, as a student and then a professor in the 1960s, sort of encounters this, encounters high Maoism at this very militant, intense point. Uh, he visits China a couple of times in the mid 60s and soon after the start of the Cultural Revolution. What's, what's interesting is he's not given five star treatment relative to some visitors to China. You know, for example, he's not invited to meet Mao. He may have seen him from a distance at, at, at a rally. Um, but it's the, um, the, 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 it's just, it seems, you know, his relationship with Maoism is sort of very much a kind of abstract, theoretical, textual one. And there's just something in his very sort of schematic, puritanical personality that just strikes a chord. Um, and then, you know, through the 1970s, again, sort of following the Chinese Maoist model. He patiently organizes and prepares, you know, he, 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 you know, people are saying, you know, let's start our people's war now. He says, no, we're not ready. So he waits until 1980, which looks geopolitically like a completely weird moment to do it, but it makes sense from a Maoist logic. Um, so we can't understand, so it looks utterly bizarre from the outside, but once you start understanding the historical context of the 1960s, the moment that someone like Guzman encounters these things, where these, these ideas, Maoist ideas, are actually very widespread and mainstream among left-wing Latin American circles, that's when it starts to make sense. And interestingly, you know, if we come back to Asia, it's a very similar story for a very different state for Nepal. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in fact, uh, that is an important part of your book, uh, the presence of Maoism in South Asia with particular emphasis on Nepal. And, you know, a Maoist influenced, inspired uh, revolution can actually get power in the case of Nepal. And, you know, you, there's quite a lot in your book about that. The, the way Maoism travels is fascinating. Uh, of course, we've got a couple people in the Q&A section who have raised the question of, of Mao Kitsch, you know, uh, statues, uh, reproductions of the Little Red Book, uh, posters, you know, that sort of thing. And we here in Southern California even have Mao's Kitchen, 
uh, you know, which has a cultural revolution theme, uh, a, a restaurant opened by a Beijing University graduate. So, you know, that kind of thing travels. But you also note in the book uh, how this reached uh, many people on the left in North America, in Western Europe, and that sort of thing. So it really does, really does take on this global feel. And uh, a couple of people have raised questions about, um, you know, the Naxalites and also, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, Nepal's 21st century history. And perhaps you'd like to say something about that. Yeah, I, the, 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 the case study of, of, of South Asia was incredibly fascinating and rewarding to research because I think it's in India and in Nepal where the, uh, where the, uh, where global Maoism has had the greatest instrumental impact in terms of the the kind of the longest running insurgencies um uh and you know to sort of back up that claim of them being long running insurgencies i would say that you know again they are the 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 maoist insurgencies um in india and nepal which have got you know so much coverage into the 21st century with you know an, a, a nepali maoist government uh being formed uh several times in kathmandu and with the indian state declaring that the maoist insurgency in sort of central eastern india is the greatest internal security threat uh facing the country to so these sort of big 21st century stories uh, but they absolutely go back to the 1960s the story that I was telling for Peru for Abimal Guzman so you know the origins of these insurgencies are sort of absolutely as um, major regional explosions uh, of the cultural revolution of the Sino-Soviet split. Um, so the, 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 the Indian insurgency, uh, which is sometimes called the Naxalite um, insurgency, um, it gets its name from a kind of standout act of police violence against um, sort of radical uh, Maoist uh, protesters in North India in 1967. Um, and Nepali Maoists have a, uh, a sort of similar sort of brief um, insurgency uh, against their state in the early 1970s. And sort of both these insurgencies, particularly the Indian one, uh, are put down uh, by a brutal state response uh, into in, in in the in the, in the 1970s. Um, but um, you know, particularly the um, Indian one, you know, absolutely springs out of the context of the uh, Sino-Soviet split of a sort of radical pro-China faction of the Indian Communist Party sort of emerging through the 1950s and 60s, sort of despite the, 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 the Sino-Indian border war and, and so on and so forth. You know, again, these Indian Maoists, like the Peruvian Maoists and like the Nepali Maoists, have a very intense relationship with uh, translated texts. So often the texts of Mao's works translated into English or Hindi or Nepali, uh, or sometimes um, uh, works of literature written in the um, uh, early People's Republic um, that sort of really seem to sort of express revolutionary ideals. Um, a couple of really interesting points from this. First of all, that, you know, as, as far as I know, no ranking leader in either the Indian or Nepali Maoist insurgencies from the 60s to the present day had proficiency in spoken or written Chinese. So it really was revolution by the book, revolution by translation. So, you know, they didn't have an independent linguistic textual relationship uh, with China, sort of outside um, translated propaganda texts, really. And the other thing which is really interesting is that the um, uh, you know, the, the most of the leaders of the Indian and Nepali 
Maoist uh, movements, you know, because it, it sprang from engagement with texts, it then stands to reason that many of them came from sort of high caste, educated elites, you know, exactly the sort of intellectual classes that Mao himself was so suspicious of and, and spent so much um, uh, energy uh, persecuting and purging during his own time in power. Um, so sort of looking at the afterlives, after the sort of suppression of these um, insurgencies after the 1970s, you know, sort of again following that Maoist model of sort of quiet, patient mobilization and organization in rural backwaters. You, know, you see that happen in China in the 30s and 40s. You also see that model to an extent being followed in India, um, in Nepal, um, also in Peru, as I, as, I, as I mentioned before, but in India uh, and, 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 and Nepal. Um, uh, the, the Maoist movement tends to be quite fractured through the 70s and 80s, uh, but you do see this, the, the future leaders and the Bases of sort of the sort of future Maoist insurgencies uh, coming coming to the fore, coming into uh, existence, um, and you know all this sort of work of sort of patient mobilising of, of of local communities, um, particularly in West Nepal and in Central Eastern India, sort of comes to fruition um, in the nineties, um, in the two uh, thousands, um, in so the Maoist Nepali civil war, which lasts between nineteen ninety. 96 and 2006 again from a geopolitical point of view completely bizarre time for a Maoist insurgency to emerge two decades after Mao's death you know seven years after Tiananmen 1989 which was really the death knell uh, for the, the sort of legitimacy of this sort of old style Chinese communist uh, ideology uh, and of course five years after the collapse of the Soviet Union and its sort of network of support for uh, global communist uh, glo global communist movements um, uh, and again in the Indian case you sort of really see see this insurgency um, sort of gaining traction amongst um, uh, um, sort of Adivasi, so um, ethnic minority groups, Central and Eastern India, after 2000. Um, uh, and you know, particularly thinking about the Nepali insurgency, um, you know, even the critics and the enemies of the Maoists in in Nepal today, and there are many of them, uh, would agree that it's you know the Maoist insurgency between 1996 and 2006 is really the one of the absolutely key factors in you know bringing down the monarchical. Uh, um, uh, Nepali state and replacing it with a federal republic after 2006. But uh, I think, you know, you know, having talked about the way that um, these sort of insurgencies are kind of nourished, if you like, by um, Maoist texts in the 1960s, and they're also encouraged by sort of militant cultural revolution media out of China in the 1960s. Um, having talked about those links, I would also really like to highlight that the Indian and the Nepali Maoist cases, fascinating instances of the, uh, the, the the translations of the mistranslations, if you like, the distortions of Mao's ideas and practices as they traveled. So, um, you know, I think one of the really interesting things about doing transnational history, it's not just saying, oh, an idea or a thing travels, it's seeing what happens to them on their travels. So two really interesting uh, alterations, if you like, or mistranslations, uh, adaptations of the Maoist creed as they come to South Asia. I think one is the way that um, Maoist parties have become very closely associated with championing the rights of um, un sort of marginalised and um, underprivileged, low caste, uh, or so-called sort of um, untouchable groups and often ethnic minority groups, so both in India uh, and in Nepal. And this is ironic given the way that Maoism in power was so violently intolerant of ethnic minority diversity and rights, especially in Tibet and Xinjiang. Another really 
interesting adaptation is the way that in India, at least, um, the Maoist movement has particularly gained traction after 2000 by becoming associated with um, a sort of militant environmentalism. Uh, so it's helped local populations in East India sort of fight against very exploitative Pollutive, uh, polluting multinational uh, mining contracts to exploit these very pristine uh, jungles uh, and the way of life within them. Um, whereas, of course, if you look at sort of high Maoism in power, um, you know, it's been credited, if that's the right word, with waging war on nature through crash collectivization. So, you know, again, with India and Nepal, you see some very interesting unintended consequences about the travel of these ideas and practices. Now, that is such a fascinating part of the book. Uh, you know, the notion of, you know, for example, the, uh, you know, the Maoist, you know, party state uh, that heralds Dajai and transforming the countryside, uh, you know, don't let nature stand in your way, make it serve you. And then, environmentalists might latch on to part of this Maoist toolkit uh, to use. And that's something that, uh, you know, I definitely pick up in the book and others in the Q&A have raised the question. Now, you made reference at the very uh, start. You talked about volunteerism and some other some other things. But what what in your mind is central to the Maoist toolkit? Um, I, I'd first of all say it's really important to remember that Maoism doesn't mean only one thing. So it's it, in English, it sounds like this kind of frozen unitary idea. Um, uh, but really, I would say that what we call Maoism, for convenience's sake, stands for a wide range of theory and practice attributed to Mao over the past 80 years. And as I just said, these ideas have been translated and mistranslated on their journeys around China and the world. So I'd argue that one of the reasons why this thing called Maoism has been able to take root in very diverse places and moments is down to its contradictory, malleable nature. Um, that said, it is possible to identify some standout characteristics that differentiate Maoism from, say, Leninism or Stalinism. And some of these differences are in kind and some are in degree. Um, and these ideas come into formal existence, of course, in the 1940s, um, but they have their antecedents in earlier parts of Mao's career. Um, so what would these standout characteristics be? Um, I think that within the context of Chinese communism, Mao was notable for really championing the use of political violence to achieve the revolution. He wasn't the only voice, but he was he was a very, very significant voice um, in the late 1920s. And a couple of his most famous catchphrases, you know, power comes out of the barrel of a gun or revolution is not a dinner party, um, express this idea. And we're thinking about the global appeal. You can see that Mao has been celebrated by insurgents across the world as the architect of, sort of defiant protracted guerrilla warfare. Um, we've already talked about volunteerism um, as a major source of Mao's international appeal. So this belief that as long as you believe you can do something, you can. Um, so revolutionary zeal rather than um, superior weaponry is the key. And this idea has definitely appealed to determined underdogs all over the world. Um, another important aspect is the way Mao acclaimed the revolutionary potential of uh, peasants and the countryside. So he emphasised their role more than that of urban workers whom traditional Marxist theory had identified as the motor of revolution. And this was a very crucial step in adapting communism to China, uh, where the population until recently was mostly rural, but it also popularized Mao's ideas in other parts of the, de of the developing world after 1949. I think that helps 
explain why um, Mao's blueprint for transforming a poor rural country often had a great appeal um, in a sort of newly decolonized, mainly rural states um, after World War II. Um, now there is a there is a feminist rhetoric in Mao's ideas. You know, he famously said that women can hold up half the sky. Of course, as is well documented in biographies and by his uh, doctor's memoir, uh, he was a serial womanizer, so his own practice fell far short of this theory. But at least there, there's there's a rhetorical agenda there, I suppose. I talked also about the importance of decolonization within Maoism, you know, Mao uh, being seen as the vanguard of anti-imperialism. You know, this, this comes back to Mao's talent for sound bites. So he once remarked that imperialism is a paper tiger. Um, and this reputation was sealed by Mao being the number one public detractor of um, American foreign policy, um, including, of course, the intervention uh, in Vietnam. And again, that's another part of his appeal uh, in developing decolonizing countries. Um, but I also, you know, Mao loved the idea of contradiction. Um, and you know, I wanted to just talk about um, three last characteristics as a way of communicating the contradictions and paradoxes of Mao's ideas. And we've talked a lot about how Mao was a profoundly autocratic man. He mm -hmm. sponsored his own personality cult. Um, he also, uh, through the rectification movement of the 1940s and onwards, he created an iron framework for party dis discipline. So he wanted to ensure homogeneity of thought. And this method of party building has been copied by many far left parties outside China. At the same time though, bizarrely, he saw himself always as a rebel as an outlier um, and you see this 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 identity um, uh, really coming to the fore during the cultural revolution when he incited millions of young people to rebel against the party establishment because Mao thought they were turning conservative and counter-revolutionary. And again, you can see this in another of his catchphrases, uh, to rebel is justified. And again, I think that's part of the appeal to Mao all over the world that he's been seen as the champion of rebellion and, and of, of rebels. So, you know, sort of coming to the end of that, that those paradoxes, you know, Maoism is a very curious contradictory political creed that at, all at the same time reveres centralized party leadership, collective obedience and anti-state rebellion. It's a very unstable mix. Indeed. And for th those watching, I just want to emphasize, you know, this is an incredibly rich book. We've only scratched the surface. We have time maybe just for one or two uh, quick questions and and hopefully quick answers. And I want everybody to understand that Professor Lavelle, who teaches at the University of London, uh, you know, she's uh, carved out this time during her sabbatical to be with us and during her duties as as a mother, uh, you know, caring for for kids. It's uh, it's late in in Britain, and so we really do appreciate this. Now, you know. Uh, Xi Jinping has spoken at Davos. Xi Jinping travels the world. Mao did not do those things, right? The you know early trip uh, you know to the Soviet Union, and that's really it. Now, part of that has to do with the Cold War at the time, the diplomatic isolation that the United States and the West tried to impose on 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 China, that sort of thing, but. Mao has this global impact and, and Maoist ideas, Mao's practices travel, but he doesn't. Maybe you could say something about Mao's global view. Yeah, it's a really interesting contradiction between the expansive quality of Mao's ideas and practices, the way that they did seize imaginations in very unpredictable and diverse times and places um, versus Mao's own rootedness 
uh, within China. So he doesn't, he's, he sort of famously, I suppose he could have gone abroad in the 1920s, mm -hmm. but I understand he decided not to because he felt he just wasn't good at foreign languages. You know, that's one of the reasons which is, which, which, which is given. Um, and so his first visit abroad is in 1949 to visit the Soviet Union. And, and also that's also struck me as incredibly interesting that, you know, by 1949, Mao has devoted um, the, the, the vast majority of his adulthood to realising um, this set of political ideas, which is you know, already um, sort of realised state power in the Soviet Union. But he has, it, it seems it hasn't occurred to him to actually go to the Soviet Union and see what this set of ideas would look like in practice, whereas obviously Liu Xiaoqi and 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 uh, and and uh, Deng Xiaoping have. Um, I mean, historians in 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 China are quite divided on this. I mean, some do see Mao as a kind of red emperor. So yes, he is a communist ideologue, but he also inherits. Um, uh, what you might call Tian Xiao Zhu Yi, so the sort of sense of uh, China being the center of the world, and he is ruler of China and has a sort of loose sense of, of, of sovereignty over many uh, places, sort of sort of blurring on the edges of the Chinese empire. Um, and you know, Mao is this curious mix of you know a, a kind of global revolutionary you know, he was devoted to the idea of achieving the global revolution and that's sort of very clear in his eagerness to found a training academy for um international revolutionaries in in, in beijing um in uh the summer autumn of 1949 but he's also very much a nationalist um uh so i mean i think with 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 mao he didn't really divide clearly between the idea of what you know what's good for the global revolution and what's good for china you know in the late 1950s you know 1960s he's very clearly standing up to take leadership of the global revolution but sort of from his his statements in behavior it, it's clear that he feels you know what what's good for china is is good for the global revolution as well and you know it's 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 very natural that this global revolution should take its inspiration from and should be directed from China. Um, and, you know, maybe that's a reason he feels he, he, he doesn't need to travel. You know, he sort of lets all these uh, global revolutionaries come and visit him uh, within China or um, uh, international leaders. They can come and talk to him, but he doesn't need to go and see them. And of course, you know, the fact that he had Zhou Enlai as one of his lieutenant, Zhou, who sort of was um, famously quite good at foreign languages and sort of very urbane and, and, and charming. And sort of Zhou really took charge of the so-called international coming out parties for the People's Republic of China, um, you know, above all, um, uh, the Geneva Conference, uh, the Bandung Conference in the 1950s, which were sort of really major successes for sort of building a kind of benevolent, credible international image for China at a time when, of course, it was diplomatically mm -hmm. very isolated. You know, really very few states had recognized China officially and, you know, absolutely not America. So that, that, that relationship with America was sort of a huge stumbling block, a sort of huge sticking point. So sort of Mao had his globetrotting alter ego, if you like, in the form of Joe and Lai. Joe and I also made a sort of very um, sort of famous and effective uh, tour around, around multiple African countries as well. So sort of that, 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 that sort of took that onus off now, I think. Yeah, he, uh, as you said, revolution by the book, he was able to export 
uh, you know, th these ideas and had obviously a very able assistant in Zhou Enlai in representing China's interests, you know, internationally. And I'd like to segue just for a final question. And there's just so much here in this book that I'd really like to, uh, to go into. But let's come back to the fact that Maoism, a global history, this wonderful book, prize-winning book that you have produced, is there's not a shelf of them, that, the, that it is unique in this regard. And why that might be, and you know, certainly a lot of people have written on Mao, and a lot of people have written on you know these various movements that we've we've touched upon, and certainly the Mao period in China, and the question of whether or not Mao is Maoism is alive in China today, and in what ways, and what's the impact. But I'd like to come back to something, you know, that's in the book, and you've already alluded to that. You know, we have a lot of things written about Hitler. We have a lot of things written about Stalin. We have those kinds of works. And I'm wondering if the, the thing holding, you know, a, a cottage industry of books about Maoism worldwide is uh, the fact that Maoism with worldwide both pleases China, but also makes the party state quite uncomfortable uh, because unlike Mao who talked about continuous revolution and uh, revolution everywhere, not peace, not the sort of peaceful engagement, the, the current government talks about peaceful rise, talks about win-win, talks about the Belt and Road as bringing connectivity and, and these kinds of things. I'm yeah. grateful for you going forth and doing all this work to write this book. Why did it have to wait until you took it on? Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because after I thought of the idea of the book, sort of 2012, 2013, my next emotion really was one of surprise. So why doesn't this book already exist, you know, particularly given the vast number of books we have written about the global impacts of Stalin and Hitler and the fact that Mao is now generally seen as a comparable figure. Um, I, I, I wonder why we didn't have a single volume history of global Maoism. And that got me thinking, well, why is it that people haven't tended to see Mao or Maoism globally? Um, I think there are a few reasons, um, some to do with Western views of history and China and others uh, to do with Chinese domestic politics. Um, I think that the spread and importance of Mao's ideas have been effaced um, by the sudden end of the Cold War as in in terms of a a, wall, a a cold war that is seen as a sort of stretching between uh, sort of Washington, London, Berlin, Prague, and Moscow. So especially since the communist collapse in Europe and the USSR, I think many Western governments and commentators. I'm obviously talking about non-specialist people, people who don't specialize on China and um, China and the Cold War. But many such non-specialists have imagined that Maoism was a historical and political phenomenon long past its sell-by date, that there was no need to engage seriously with it because it had been left in the dust um, with all other ideologies um, in 1989. I think there's also a greater sense of cultural and political distance between, say, Western countries uh, and China, greater than the sense of distance with Nazi Germany or Stalin's Russia. And I think this has led to a greater sense of detachment about telling, um, uh, sort of about, about trying to locate um, the story of Chinese communism within global history. Um, but also to sort of get on to the last part of your question, the People's Republic of China itself has been invested in effacing the global history of Maoism. You know, as you said, for the last 20 or so years, China's rulers have theorized that uh, the country will have a peaceful rise in contrast to the violence 
of the rise of the West. And history is a really important part of that narrative. So government publicity repeats that China has never interfered in the sovereign affairs of other countries. And under these circumstances, China doesn't want to illuminate its desire for leadership of the world revolution during the Maoist period, because this was a time when China exported you know, not, not just ideology in the form of hundreds of millions of copies of the Little Red Book, but also exported harder currencies of revolution, and so money, weapons and training for global insurgencies, especially in the developing world. So because this history raises so many sensitive political issues for the CCP today, it's hard to research within China. So many key archival histories and oral histories remain out of reach. So at this point, you know, writing the book, um, uh, you know, when I, when I, when I, when I worked all this out, <laughs> the writing the book became a really steep logistical challenge because um, I knew that many of my ter- materials would not be um, available, uh, they would not be declassified for me within China. So it really um, uh, launched um, a kind of global archival travels, some of which I did myself uh, using the foreign language knowledge um, that I have. Um, but also I wouldn't have been able to do the work without the assistance of some absolutely fantastic uh, research assistants. So, you know, I could work in Chinese and English and French and Spanish and, yeah, slow German and Italian. Um, But, um, uh, you know, but I also um, was very lucky to commission your really wonderful research assistants in Nepali, in um, uh, also in, in, in Peru, but in, 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 in Hindi, um, in Mongolian, um, uh, in Vietnamese and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I think one of the reasons that the book hadn't existed before is, is it is, it is a logistical challenge, but I just, I see the book really as a, as, as a first draft. Um, you know, it will soon be overtaken and surpassed um, by, you know, um, many other um, uh, further reaching histories of, 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 of global Maoism, but it's been utterly fascinating to be part of this conversation. So I, I really did enjoy every moment of the research and writing. And you're quite uh, you know, modest in suggesting that this book is going to be overtaken. I don't see that happening anytime soon for all of the reasons that you just said. But also, again, you know, the drive won't come from within China. Uh, a Chinese scholar couldn't write this book and publish it, let alone translate, make it available because of uh, no state claims Hitler. No state claims Stalin, but Mao is still claimed, of course, by the PRC. So I think that's a factor. But I would also emphasize that there are just some absolutely outstanding archival mainland Chinese historians who you absolutely have the granular, meticulous um, archival knowledge to write this book. It's just a question of the overall political publishing publishing climate making it possible and you know I there's no way I would have been able to research and write my book without the outstanding contributions of the incredible historians of uh, Mao era China and the Cold War um, writing in Chinese in mainland China today and and that is very much evident uh, the citations in your book, to the work by Chinese scholars in China and Chinese scholars working abroad are plentiful. Uh, You draw on some really terrific, terrific work that others have done. Last uh, goodbye question is, Mao loves the Monkey King. Do you? I do love the Monkey King, but for different reasons to Mao. Yeah, the story that that became the uh, really interesting link between the two projects. I took on the two projects at the same time without a, a sort of clear intellectual. I, they were just two projects I was really passionate about, and I thought I would learn so much through doing. Uh, doing doing both of them. Uh, But what was 
um, uh, extraordinarily interesting was the intellectual links that, that, that emerged between the two of them. So Mao uh, was a lifelong fan of Sun Wukong, uh, the Monkey King, and um, various stories of his exploits uh, within Shi Yoji Journey to the West. And he was actually rereading the book on the eve of the Cultural Revolution. So as he was sort of plotting his attacks against the party establishment, uh, and he directly invoked the name of Sun Wukong as a as a rebel, as a troublemaker against the establishment of heaven. He sort of invoked this idea in uh, mobilizing you know, red guards, you know, young Chinese people um, as his kind of uh, sort of uh, uh, stormtroopers, if you like, to, to attack the party establishment in 1966. Um, so in terms of what appealed to Mao about uh, Monkey King, yeah, I think it was his uh, rebellion. I think it was, you know, he sort of really spoke to Mao's uh, anarchist tendencies. But, you know, as we said, you know, Mao is very much a split personality. Uh, he sees himself as a rebel, as an outlier. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of monkey king in him. Uh, but he's also an authoritarian, uh, you know, a man who is addicted to his own personality cult. He's a sort of arch manipulator, uh, whereas Monkey King actually is, is very much childlike in his, in his behavior. You know, he really, um, often Monkey King really doesn't seem to overthink the consequences of his action. That absolutely cannot be said uh, for Mao. He sort of absolutely knows everybody's weaknesses and how to manipulate them. Um, uh, I think the, the other thing that Mao liked about um, Monkey King and Journey to the West was the demonology in it actually. So uh, as anybody who, who knows the book will know, um, uh, Monkey King and the other pilgrim pilgrims doing this penitential uh, journey from China to the West. They're regularly beset by uh, man-eating demons who want to capture and eat them. Uh, and in order to do this, these um, uh, demons often engage in ingenious subterfuge, disguising themselves as beautiful women or delicious food or kind of pious uh, priests and monks. And again, I think that sort of really spoke to Mao's suspicious personality that, you know, even good revolutionaries are actually, you know, they, 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 they can be sort of demons or harboring uh, evil ideas. Um, but I think, I think ultimately, you know, I, I love the irreverence and the, 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 the chutzpah and the mischief making of, of, of Monkey. Uh, and there's no way that Mao was uh, prepared to see that, 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 that Weltanschauung, that, that kind of uh, uh, vision of the world actually sort of come to fruition. You know, as is as well known, you know, Mao was horrified by the anarchy that actually resulted in the cultural uh, revolution and the, the sort of the big, um, uh, the, 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 in a way, the, the, the biggest political result of the Cultural Revolution by 68-69 is the imposition of a um, military uh, dictatorship over, over China. It's the shoring up of the power of the uh, power of the army. Um, so, you know, Mao liked monkeys, irreverence and rebellion, but sort of only 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 so far um so i think ultimately you know monkey king is 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 not going to be a favorite of authoritarians and of course the other thing that mao did is he completely took out the religion from the story you, know, you read that book and it's such a wealth of insight into chinese ideas about spirituality and the afterlife and the three great teachings you know buddhism taoism uh, and confucianism and that that pretty much gets erased by the readings of the mao era um, um, so it was it was a starting point that that you know Mao's love of journey to the West, but there's 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 there's, there's, there's so much more in that incredibly rich and diverting novel. And and so the novel now available in English, uh, in Professor Lovell's translation, uh, is definitely worth a read for all of the reasons uh, she's just highlighted, and the book that we got. Uh, that we've come together to talk about is <laughs> equally so. I cannot recommend this book any, any more than we already have. It is terrific. Every chapter will bring in uh, just these vivid examples and these really compelling uh, bits of evidence. 
And it is stunning, the various uh, places, the various sources that you have drawn upon for this. It really will, you know, it is this landmark volume. Uh, I do hope that others will pick up the mantle and continue to look at, at Mao abroad uh, and Mao across the, across the decades, because that's clearly something that we could learn a lot more about. Yeah, I, I should also say we have some wonderful national studies of the impact of Mao outside China, you know, in, in France, um, in India, um, in in Nepal. You know, we could have more of them. I don't think we have a single English language study of Mao in Italy or or, or, or West Germany, but we do have some sort of wonderful local um, national studies. Um, uh, I suppose I was I was keen to bring a variety of case studies sort of into dialogue with each other um, through a comparative study. But, you know, again, I couldn't have done my study without, you know, wonderful work being done on um, particular case studies by um, stellar scholars. Yeah, the bits and pieces here and there, but Maoism, a global history comes to us from Professor Lavelle. And I would really encourage people uh, to get this book in whatever form, audiobook, you know, ebook, uh, paperback and hardcover. It is worth whatever time you can invest in it. And so we are grateful that you've given up, uh, you know, time from your work, time from your family, time from your sabbatical to be with us. And so on behalf of everybody who is watching right now, but also the many people who will watch this on our YouTube channel and on our website when it goes up, uh, perhaps later even today. We would encourage you to take advantage of this great opportunity. Professor Lavelle, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for this great opportunity and absolutely fantastic questions, thank you. A great pleasure to share this time. Friends, we look forward to seeing you again. Go to china.usc.edu, subscribe to our newsletter so that you'll learn about other events as they, as they come up. Take care, everyone. Bye.